Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I cannot begin the program today, I just can't, without making a few brief comments about the extraordinary and so very disturbing events that have transpired in America today, which actually relate in a lot of ways to the story you're about to hear. By events, I'm speaking about Minneapolis, Glynn County, Georgia, even Central Park, and the apparent racism which they represent, all in the backdrop of the pandemic, with not only the horrific health consequences, but the devastating economic consequences to those who can least afford it, and those who now need a little assistance from the rest of us. And it's amazing how just a little assistance can go so far. And as I thought about all of this in the background as I'm preparing for today, it occurred to me that what happened 80 years ago, which was very relevant six months ago, may be even more relevant in today's crazy world. I believe that because I believe the messages and the lessons that can be derived from histories, such as that you're about to see, not only stand the test of time, but also those lessons and messages can serve us all very well as we hopefully move forward to try to make our world a little bit, or maybe more than a little bit better. With that, and before I begin the actual slide presentation, I have just two minutes or so of preliminary comments. Um, that's just a little introduction. I do hope and I do believe that you'll find the next 60 minutes, maybe 65 minutes, really hard to time this. And I don't know, I'm, this is the first time I'm doing this virtually, so we'll see how this technology works. But I do find it all, I do believe that you'll find it not only informative, but also interesting. And that's in no small part, because when I first put this together, I showed it to my two daughters and I asked them for some input and advice and constructive criticism. And they both, they both gave me some really good suggestions which have been incorporated into what you're about to see. My older daughter is a teacher. And she said, Dad, from my perspective, you've got to start off by telling people, why are you doing this? What is your purpose? What are your objectives? And I thought that too was pretty good advice. I have three objectives. One is to hopefully inspire those who view this presentation to act vigorously when they see wrongs and to reach out and help people who need some assistance. A second objective is to show what happened to help thereby help folks remember so that it never happens again to any minority group. With that, I want to show you something and I'm gonna read just two sentences from this real live, yes, real piece of newspaper. This was in our local newspaper um, about a year ago. I'm gonna read two sentences from it. Americans by and large do not deny that the Holocaust happened. They are just frighteningly fuzzy on the details. Millennials display an even more shocking ignorance. 22% had not heard of or were not sure that they had heard of the Holocaust at all. Pretty stunning. Now I do realize that so many of the viewers today are very knowledgeable about what happened 80 years ago. Nonetheless, even from a purely historical perspective, I think you'll see and hear some unique things that perhaps you haven't heard before. My third objective is to help honor those who suffered through the Holocaust and its consequences. And I'm keenly aware that the story that you're about to see is only one of millions and that some are more dramatic, many are more tragic. But I tell this story, I tell this particular story because it's one I know, it's one I know to be true. And by the end of this, you'll see why I know it to be true from the documentation that I have. It has some unique and really some remarkable circumstances that I think uh, merge very well with the objectives that I just outlined. And I think it's so relevant to today's world. Two quick final points. Don't worry about dates 
Don't worry about necessarily completely understanding the family connections. None of that's really terribly important. Um, just go with the flow as I'm going to go with the flow here. And um, finally, if you like this, if you think it's worthy of being shown to others, and that maybe some others should see this, please let me know. You can send me an email. It's real simple. Bob, B-O-B, Gans, G-A-N-S, the number seven, at gmail.com. I'd be more than happy to share this with others. With that, crossing my fingers and toes, I'm going to attempt now to get up the slideshow. So bear with me a sec. I'm going to hit that. I'm going to hit that. I'm going to hit this. I'm going to hit that. And hopefully you all now see on your screen, thank you, Melanie, I see a thumbs up. <laughs> the title of the presentation, as you know, is The Life-Saving Kindness and Courage of Strangers, the story of Greta and Rudy. Greta is my mom, Rudy, my dad. And I'm gonna begin this by saying the same as I've begun on the other occasions when I've presented this slideshow, by saying that I should not be doing this. I should not be here today. Not at all, I'm not supposed to exist at all. Neither should my two daughters. This picture happened to be taken about a year ago when they were both pregnant. Neither should any of my four grandchildren. This in the lower left-hand corner, that's my mom, Greta. The only reason I'm here and that my daughters and grandchildren were ever born is because of the courage and endurance of my parents and because people including total strangers, reached out to help save the lives of both my mom and my dad. And my family's story proves that, that act, proves that acts of kindness to others, generosity to others, standing up and having the courage to stand up for what's right and what's fair and actively opposing what's wrong, can and does convert fear to hope, loss to success, and devastation to happiness. On this somewhat busy screen, you'll see an asterisk. That asterisk will appear on subsequent slides. That's when people, including total strangers, saved the lives of my parents. On the bottom, you see Pastor Martin Niemöller. Many of you may know his name. Many of you may know what he wrote. Some of you may know it by heart. Um, Pastor Martin Niemöller wrote what I'm about to show you about six or seven years after the end of World War II. I'm showing it to you for two reasons, which I'll explain. First, they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade union. Sorry, I have to stop this. I get emotional sometimes. <laughs> I have to control myself. All right. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews. I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and no one, was left, was, no one was left to speak for me. As I indicated, Pastor Niemöller wrote this some years after World War II. I show it to you for two reasons. One is because, obviously, I at least think these words are so extraordinary and meaningful. Second, it's a good introduction to this. This is what looks like an unassuming black binder. Inside this black binder is a detailed 96-page typewritten memoir that was written by my dad's brother, Uncle Vic. Uncle Vic wrote that in Shanghai in January and February 1939. I'll explain how that happened as we go through this. Historians, lawyers, consider a document like that to be really important because it's a contemporaneous document. It was written very near, it was written within weeks at most months of the events which Uncle Vic describes. And so it's not distorted by lack of memory or misremembering or whatever happens to the brain 10, 15 years later after, the, after an event happens. It was written, as I say, within weeks at most months of the events in question. Uh, Vic's memoir, Uncle Vic's memoir is now on file uh, with the United States Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. And Vic wrote in January, February 1939, it is not true that every Austrian turned into a Jew hater or animal. 
but I cannot help blaming my decent countrymen who had always opposed Hitler. Nobody spoke up when it would have been so important. And now it was too late. And they too now face the threat of the concentration camp. This is my mom on her 99th birthday. This is my mom during the years in question. As some of you know who signed on a little early, my mom is going to be 101 in August. This is my dad in 1934. This is my dad shortly before he passed away. My dad's name Rudy, my mom's name Greta. In Austria, Greta is pronounced Gretel. My mom had one sibling, a brother. Believe it or not, he was named Hans in Austria, Hansel and Gretel. Here's Hansel and Gretel growing up in Austria during the good times. My dad had two, this is the last family photo of my dad's family in Austria. This is my dad. This is Uncle Vic who wrote the memoir. Here you see the third brother. All three of the brothers went through the same thing. Two sisters and the parents. This lady is Uncle Vic's wife. Volley. She turns out to be something of a heroine in this story, and we'll come back to Volley in a little while. They grew up in Austria, as probably you all know. It's a gorgeous country, the Alps, rolling green, pil ro rolling green pastures and hills, the Danube River, an extraordinary history of magnificent art, beautiful music, great science and math achievements. And for many years, for decades, the Jewish population was deeply integrated successfully integrated into the Austrian society. Doctors, lawyers, scientists, merchants, great musicians and composers, as well as Austrian Jewish military officials and senior officers. My dad's grandfather was physician to the royal court of Austria. But unfortunately, there was always a substantial undercurrent of anti-Semitism, as there is to this day, unfortunately, so many other places. And of course, as you all know, Austria, right next door to Germany. Here you see another map. Austria, Germany, you see the town of Linz. This is where my parents grew up. The D is the town of Dachau. The distance from Linz to Dachau is approximately the same as from San Diego to Santa Barbara. In good weather, in good traffic, on good roads, driving from San Diego to Santa Barbara takes about no less than five hours, maybe six hours, and you'll see why I'm telling you that in a little while. The city of Linz, Austria, where my dad and mom were raised. This is my, where my mom lived. She lived with her mother, her father, and her brother in, up here. Down below, you see the name T-A-U-S-S-I-G, -S -S Tausig. That's my mom's maiden name. They had a restaurant which served alcoholic beverages, uh, and they lived upstairs. <clears throat> Linz also had a magnificent synagogue. Here you see a virtual reconstruction done by an architect some years ago, an architect student who found the, the actual plans. I want to draw your attention to this front door. Notice this door in relation to the size of the building. This is a reproduction of the interior. This is an actual photograph of that front door. And you can get a sense now of how huge the synagogue was. It was built in the 1870s, expanded in the early 1990s. One more photo pertaining to it. This is Uncle Gus, one of the three brothers emerging from that synagogue with his brand new bride, Melita, on September 23, 1939, excuse me, 1938. Linz was also the hometown of this fellow. Now, technically, he was not born in Linz, but he always considered it to be the hometown. Also, as an aside, it was also the hometown of Adolf Eichmann. As you all know, I believe, as a young man, Hitler went to Germany, he wasn't particularly successful. He wasn't particularly brilliant, but smart enough, but he was an extraordinary spellbinding speaker, ruthless, and of course, a virulent anti-Semite. Briefly, the history, early 1933, he becomes chancellor. Spring of 1933, serious anti-Jewish discriminatory laws. May 1933, the famous German book burning. Then he becomes absolute dictator. 
In March 1938, Hitler's Nazis take control of Austria. My mom's story. Then I'll turn to my dad's story. This is my mother's father, Victor, not to be confused with Uncle Vic. He was a soldier for Austria in World War I. Handsome, active in the Linz business community, in the Linz synagogue, he was in the choir. I can hear his baritone voice to this day. And he was an expert in distilling alcoholic beverages. He was, in today's world, he would be called a master brewer. And that's how they served alcoholic beverages in the restaurant below where they lived. This is my grandmother, my mother's mother, Ella, who raised Hansel and Gretel along with her husband. My mother was educated in high school, learned French and English, thank goodness. She spent a year in Vienna becoming a certified seamstress. A big deal in those days to be a seamstress because you couldn't always readily get clothes, particularly as it turns out during the war years, because all the material went towards the war effort. And this became very important for my mom. My mom was active in a local Jewish group called Blau Weiss, and that's where she first met and fell in love with Rudy. In the mid-1930s, people, especially Jews, in Linz and Austria, they were concerned about the rise of Nazis in Germany. They had heard bad stories about how Jews were being treated in Germany, including closure of Jewish businesses, taking of Jewish properties, beatings, tortures, rapes, and yes, even rumors of concentration camps. But they thought, exaggerations. We're well integrated in the Austrian society. In my mom's autobiography, she says, that couldn't happen here in Austria. That's how everyone felt. In, mom, in March of 1938, my mom took a ski trip up to the Austrian Alps. This is a picture of her on the skis, the Alps. My mom did not know because up in the Alps, in 1938, there's no phones, there's no cell phones, there's no communication with the outside world. My mom had no idea that while she was up there with her friends, on March 12, 1938, Hitler and the Germans and the Nazis marched into and took control of Austria and Linz. This is what my mom and her friends saw when they returned. This is not a family photograph. I got this out of the internet, but you can see over here, Linz, obviously the Nazi symbols, in my mom's words, yes, things were getting bad, but that this could actually happen, it never occurred to us. My mom's father, my grandfather, immediately, immediately arrested. Why? Because he was a Jew. Many other Jewish officials of other Jewish organizations were likewise immediately arrested and thrown in jail, as were Jewish and non-Jewish teachers and professors, lawyers, many Linz government officials, many Austrian military officials, and into my mother's home with her mother and her brother, while her father was now in jail, were two of the worst. Two members of the SS, the most brutal of all the Nazis, who literally watched every movement they made, whether they went to the kitchen, the bedroom, the bathroom, day and night. And the Tausigs were all barred from even, even entering their business, much less operating it. On March 13, 1938, the day after Hitler took control of Austria, he wanted to do a celebratory speech. He wanted to do it in what he considered to be his hometown. Here you see Hitler on the balcony over the main plaza in Linz. The next screen that you're gonna see, I think, for me at least, is one of the more remarkable telling ones. The next screen you're going to see is a part of a biography, a detailed biography that my mother's brother Hansel has written. Remember his father was in jail. He had SS in his, in his place. My father was on medication for his heart condition. I took a package of medication and was bringing it to him to the jail. On the way I had one of the strangest experiences of my life. Hitler was speaking from a balcony to a huge mass of people. As I passed, a strange feeling of elation overcame me, although I was fully aware who was speaking up there. My only explanation is that he radiated some kind of mass hypnosis. This would also explain the hysterical reaction to all the nonsense 
he uttered. Think about this. Hitler was well aware of what Hitler stood for. I'm sorry, did I say that right? Hans was well aware of what Hitler stood for. He had two SS in his residence. His father was in jail. While he was walking to jail, he was seeing Jews beaten, rousted, taken, others taken to jail. He knew the horrors that were likely to be faced, and yet he was transfixed by, his, by Hitler's speech. In his words, he felt elated. How could this be? The dangers of a demagogue. When I tell this to folks, I tell them that I at least take from this, and maybe others can and should, that whether I'm listening to a politician or a preacher or a poet or a professor, whether this person is a Democrat or Republican, liberal or conservative, libertarian, radical right, I don't care. If the speaker is appealing to passion and prejudice, I gotta step back, have a healthy skepticism, make sure that what is being said resonates with my heart and my soul. My mom's parents realized that there was no future for Jewish youth in Austria. Members of the Jewish community in Linz, some who did not really know my, my, uh, my parents, working with total strangers in the English government, managed to get a number of youth, Austrian youth, and you know, I know some of the stories about how it was done. My mother got out under a domestic permit. This is the condition that the British government actually put on the permit, leave to land on conditions that the holder register at once with the police and does not enter into any employment other than as a resident in service in a private household. She was to be a maid, but she was to be able to get out. As for Hans, he wanted to go and did leave for Palestine. He left Linz forever on July 31, 1938, the very next day on August 1, 1938. My mom, Greta, bear in mind she was just about 18 years old, was to leave Linz forever to go to some foreign unknown country. She only spoke a little English. Shortly before she was about to go to the train with her mom, she wanted to try to say goodbye to her dad. Her dad was in jail. They went to the jail. They found out he was not in jail. He had been rousted out of jail, taken to a new Nazi government tax office on, under trumped up charges that he had failed to pay taxes. There, my mother was able to see her father. There, saying what they believed to be their last goodbyes, my grandfather put his hand on the head of my mom. Lester. And they then said what they anticipated would very likely be their last goodbyes to one another. My grandmother then took my 18 year old mom to the train station. She got on the train, waved goodbye. And as my mom has stated, it was so bewildering. I shall never forget how hard it was to say goodbye to my parents and to Rudy, not knowing if I will ever see them again. My mom's mom went back to her apartment just a few months earlier, she had boisterous teenagers, her loving husband in the apartment. Now she was alone. Her husband was in jail. Her children, heaven knows what would happen to them. And she was facing a terribly frightening future. I'm gonna come back to my mom's story in a little bit. My dad's story. This is my dad as a young man in Linz. This is my dad and his two brothers, Uncle Vic and Uncle Gus. Uncle Vic, who wrote the memoir. My dad, he was an excellent student, a great soccer player, I'm told. And I could remember watching him play with soccer balls. Well-educated and trained as an accountant, fully employed in an insurance company for many years and never once ran afoul of the law. Sorry, let me go back here for a second. Shortly after Hitler and the German Nazis took control of Austria, my dad, just like my mother's father, was immediately arrested and locked in the Linz jail. Why? Because he was Jewish and also, perhaps also ironically, because he had volunteered to be secretary for the Austrian Jewish Veterans, Military Veteran Association. As Uncle Vic wrote in his diary, but why was Rudy arrested, we asked, who did not have a single enemy. It was like a bomb had been dropped and we all 
were on the verge of mental collapse. There was never a time when we could feel safe from the claws of the, of the Gestapo. The conditions in that jail, as you'll see in a few minutes, minutes were unbelievably humiliating, at times horrific, and always terrifying. I'll show you something about that in a couple minutes. Meanwhile, as Uncle Vic wrote, we were all haunted by the thought of Dachau, the notorious concentration camp. After six weeks, my dad was released for jail. I really, from, from jail, I really don't know why, but he was. So he went back to his place of business, the insurance company. He found out he didn't have a job anymore. Why? Here's a testimonial. This was actually typed in 1938. The original is in uh, German, but uh, they typed an English one. Uh, confirms that Mr. Gans was employed since 1922. During his work, he distinguished himself by special sense of duty, greatest conscientiousness and diligence. He was only dismissed on account of the new reform of the business, no Jews. He then went back to his place of residence. He had been thrown out of his place of residence. Nazis occupied it. On the streets, no job, no home, subject to rearrest at any time. Several months then passed, during which most Jews in Austria had their possessions and their money taken away, that is, stolen by the Nazis, were kicked out of their homes, which were then taken over by the Nazis, were prevented from operating or even entering into their businesses, which they had established and run successfully for decades, and were subject to search at any time, arrest at any time, beatings at any time, tortures at any time, and imprisonment at any time. Suicides were not uncommon, and Uncle Vic identifies some friends. Sorry, I need a drink of water. He had some good friends who just couldn't take anymore. In October 1938, all Jews had to get the J stamp, J for Jewish, of course. Here you see my dad's original, let's see if I can, my original, original passport. As I hold this, I get chills. Um, it's chilling to this day to see the Nazi stamps and, insigni and insignias. And then came November, 1938. On November 8, my dad and his two brothers, Uncle Vic and Uncle Gus, were all arrested again, thrown into Lynch Jail cells number 30, 31, and 32. November 9, 1938, 38, the night of the broken glass, Kristallnacht. That night, Jewish homes, hospitals, and schools throughout Germany and Austria were ransacked and demolished in a frenzy orchestrated by the Nazis. 7,000 Jewish businesses were destroyed or seriously damaged. Beatings, killings, rapes were widespread. 30,000 Jewish men were immediately arrested, thrown into jail, or taken right away to concentration camps. November 9 and 10, recall that synagogue in Linz. It was ransacked, burned, and destroyed, as were hundreds of additional uh, synagogues throughout Germany and Austria. Uncle Vic writes in his memoir about the people who were inside the synagogue at the time. I won't go into it now, but you can imagine, or maybe you can. It's hard to imagine. Recall this, Uncle Gus. That was the last wedding ever held in that temple. On November 10, my mother's father was likewise arrested, thrown into the same jail where the three brothers were. This is a letter, I'm gonna show you in a moment, a letter, a detailed letter that my grandfather wrote to his son, who is now in Palestine, to Hansel. He wrote it in March 10 of 1939. I'll explain how that happened in a little while. Whoops, what happened there? There we go, detailed German letter. This is in part what it says about the jail. First, they took us to the police station and then to SS Hell. There they tortured us for three days. Some were beaten to the point where they were unrecognizable. 53 of us were then thrown into a small cell meant for 16 and we were only allowed to sleep every other night. 
November 12, German decree, all Jewish businesses were to be permanently closed. November 15, 1938. November 15, 1938. Winter time becoming serious in Austria. 3 a.m. in the morning, the jail cells slam open. The Gans brothers and others were marched outside in their street clothes, marched to a flatbed truck, ordered to get on the truck, and in Uncle Vic's words, packed like standing sardines, freezing. It was sleeting, rain and snow. They feared, and after many hours of transport, they ultimately knew that their worst fears were coming true. They were soon to enter Dachau. As Uncle Vic wrote, so much was already known about Dachau that the mere word or thought of it caused horror. This is a diagram that is in Uncle Vic's memoir that he wrote, that he did. A very detailed diagram. It's got an index and everything. Here's the entrance. This is where my dad and his brothers were imprisoned. I'll show you why I know that in a moment or two. An eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, though interesting, doesn't get a, give you a sense of the enormity of this place. This is an overhead photo that I found online taken by the US Air Force. This is the camp itself. This is adjoining camp facilities, including manufacturing facilities where arguably some of the luckier ones under slave labor conditions were sent. The whole complex is about 15 acres. Excuse me, excuse me, 15 football fields. The brothers, once they arrived after that lengthy trip, it must have been at least eight hours. I mean, if it's five hours from here to Santa Barbara, and in those days, I don't know how long it took, but at least that, in sleep, rain, in the night, with fear, they were marched into this area. And there, they were told to stand at attention for hours. And anyone who moved at all was slapped, punched, beat, kicked, or worse. As Uncle Vic writes in his memoir, I would have given anything to be able to move my index fingers, my fingers, pardon me. I would have given anything to be able to move my, my fingers just a little bit. Finally, with much relief, they were told to march into one of the adjoining facilities where, of course, the heads were shaved, the clothes were taken, their possessions were taken, they were given summer uniforms, a lot of bad things happened right then and there, and then they were sent out. And during the next days and weeks, they observed the following. Beatings of prisoners with thick wooden sticks of the young, the old, the sick, for any reason or for no reason at all. The kickings were with heavy black pointed boots. There were also hard, extensive whippings for any reason or for no reason at all. As Vic describes it, Uncle Vic describes it, two Nazi guards would do it. One would do the whipping, the other would do the counting. The person doing the counting would count up to 14, and more often than not, he'd say, oh my goodness, I forgot where I was. I'm going to start all over again. And they did. Torture by awful devices, as described by Uncle Vic, which I have neither the stomach nor the interest and thankfully not the time to describe. Hangings, shootings, of course, these were all completely innocent people. And then on occasion, there were crazy, incredible inspections by the outside world. The outside world were beginning to hear rumors of bad things happening in, Nazi, in, the, in the concentration camps. So they contacted the Nazis. They said, hey, we want to do an inspection. The Nazi says, sure, when do you want to come? They set up a date and a time. Well, Uncle Vic was working in the yard, and out of the corner of his eye, he saw some prisoners, clean uniforms, playing soccer and singing. The inspection team had arrived at the appointed, at the appointed hour. The Nazis put on this show. They saw and they left. They thought, well, it's not so bad. I guess it's not so bad after all. In addition, they had the prisoners write postcards home to their family. This is my dad's postcard. Here is the original. In the upper left-hand corner, you can see 
Dachau. Here you see my dad's name, Rudolf Ganz. He was in block 26. He wrote this to his sister, Liesel, who had then married, Liesel Bruckner. And what this says in effect is, hello, Liesel, how are you? Don't worry about us, we're fine. I hope you are well, send money. Of course, when the money was sent, the Nazis confiscated it, but this was another way that the Nazis tried to portray that everything was fine in the concentration camp. And then on December 21, 1938, December 21, 1938, the Gans brothers were released from Dachau. What led to this? How could this possibly be? Why were they released? At that time, when the Gans brothers were imprisoned in Dachau, it was not yet a full-blown extermination camp, not yet were the ovens operating, not yet were the gas chambers operating. Yes, many were killed due to torture, starvation, beatings, but if you had a provable, establishable way to get out of Austria immediately, the German authorities would let you do that. You'd leave with nothing but the clothes on your back, but you'd get out if you could prove that you could get out in 24 hours. But when you are a prisoner in Dachau, how can you provide proof of that? Where do you go once you're sent back to Linz or Vienna? How do you prove you have permission from another country and tickets for a train or a boat or maybe even a plane? How do you actually get there? How do you get through the incredible amount of red tape that you know the Germans were, maybe to some extent still are, known for the bureaucratic regulations, stamps, signatures, affidavit fees. Here's a brief, very, oversight, no, very, very oversimplified summary of how the Gans brothers did that, or better and more accurately stated, how so many people, complete strangers, set free my dad and his two brothers. First, getting out of Dachau. Max Hirschfeld. This is stunning to me. I don't know why, but a man by the name of Max Hirschfeld was appointed Commission of Jewish Affairs in Linz. At great, great personal risk to himself, he took it upon himself to deceive his boss, a Nazi official, to sign a document saying that there were three ship tickets for the Gans brothers to go to Shanghai, leaving from Italy on December 22. 1938, when in fact, there were no such tickets. As Uncle Vic writes, and we went free, only through the endless effort of Mr. Hirschfeld, may his name be inscribed in the golden book of the heaven. He managed that the Austrian Nazi official signed papers for the Gestapo, that he, the Austrian official, had made reservation, that he had made a reservation for the three brothers to go to Shanghai, and that we would depart for this destination immediately upon our release. I'm hearing a little noise. I don't know if you all are, but I'm going to proceed, I hope. I guess I'm getting feedback. No, someone is unmuted. Yeah, Bob, I'm trying to figure out who it is. We'll take care of it. All right, I'm going to continue. Sure. Okay, I'm going to come back, in fact, to this USA affidavit in a minute. This was a extremely critical document and I'll discuss that in a few minutes. Remember I indicated that Uncle Vic's wife, Vali, was something of a heroine. She made multiple trips from Linz to Vienna, back to Linz, back to Vienna, to numerous governmental offices and spent hours and hours waiting and talking and pleading getting through the endless bureaucracy and securing the required papers, signatures, stamps, paying the fees that, if necessary, bribes if necessary, and then went in desperation to the USA consulate in Vienna. And there several angels told her that there was a family of five that was scheduled to board a boat at Genoa, Italy, to go to Shanghai on December 22, 1938. The family of five, I don't know why, for whatever reason, they decided not to go. Three tickets were available. 
Molly secured those tickets. The Gans brothers were released on the morning of December 21. The train was leaving Linz at 10 p.m. at night on December 21. They had been released in the morning, sent back to Linz. They made their way to the train station, got to the train station at about nine o'clock at night. But Volley was not there. Nine ten at night, she was not there. Nine twenty at night, she was not there. Nine thirty, nine forty at night. At nine forty-five, she runs up to the train platform, breathlessly waving papers. She had the train tickets. She had the ship tickets. My dad and his two brothers, they boarded the train at 10 p.m. Had she been half an hour later, they would have been immediately arrested, thrown back into Dachau. End of story. Why to Shanghai? Well, as so many of you know, at this point in time, everyone was closing their borders and virtually no country in the world would accept immigrants from Germany or Austria. But through a historical oddity, Shanghai was an open city. December 22, they made their way to the ship. This I found in my dad's papers. This is the ship, the Lloyd Trestino. These are the tickets, two of the tickets at least, the original tickets I have here. And you can see it says going from Genoa to Shanghai, leaving December 22. Gus Gans, Rudy Gans, Uncle Vic had his own ticket. I'm not sure why. This was a photograph in my dad's papers of the ship that evening that they boarded. This is my dad, Uncle Vic, and Uncle Gus on the ship. They arrived ultimately on January 13, 1939. My dad's pants, passport is stomped and stamped in Hong Kong that day. Now, while Shanghai was a real paradise compared to where they had come from, by any other standard, it was an awful place. Overcrowded, dire poverty, great disease, dirt. They arrived there, of course, with nothing but the clothes on their back. How are they going to survive in Shanghai? Through the kindness and the hard work of the Jewish community that had already gotten there in Shanghai, they got a one room, not a one bedroom, a one room apartment. Let me see what's on the next slide. These are pictures that, photographs. I actually have dozens of these that I found in my dad's papers. This is what it looked like at the time. These are some of the maybe cleaner photographs. They had a one room, not a one bedroom apartment where they had one piece of furniture, a bed, and they took turns sleeping in the bed. But how do you other survive? How do you otherwise survive for an indeterminate future in a place like that with your own background? They managed to survive with the extraordinary kindness of strangers, including a lady that I had never heard of before until I show you a letter a, let, a, let, a lady by the name of Mrs. DeVault. Mrs. DeVault gave the three brothers one square meal a day. This is my, oh, this is a map of Shanghai. Let's show you this. This is the actual map. And you can see it's the 10th edition, 1938, that the Navy was distributing in Shanghai. The Navy actually had uh, some facilities there. My dad used this map to get around. I used this map to find where my dad and his brothers were living in that one room apartment. Back to Mrs. DeVault. Britain, Shanghai, 1939. Dear Mrs. DeVault, we want to express our heartfelt gratitude for all your kindness and amiability you have granted to us. We can't give expression often enough how to estimate what you have done for us and what we have caused you in trouble, expenses, and inconvenience. We thank, you from, we thank you once more for your generosity from the bottom of our heart. We will never forget it. And our desire will be all our life to repay you for all this in every respect. 
they were in Shanghai for nine months, but they had always wanted to emigrate to America. How do you get to America? Here's that affidavit of support. I never knew this existed until uh, about a year and a half ago when my cousin showed me it. He has the original of it. It's signed by Albert Van Dam, signed June 17, 1938 in New York City. Who the heck is Albert Van Dam and why did he sign it? And what is it? Albert Van Dam testified, a swore, that Gustav Gans and Rudolf Gans were his cousins. They were not. I looked up Albert Van Dam and found him on the internet. I found an obituary. He was a moderately successful te textile manufacturer in Manhattan. We believe he was a distant relative of the family. He did not know the Gans brothers. They did not know him. He swore to the United States that he would support them for three years. He turned over all sorts of private financial information to prove that he could. Without this, they would not have gotten out. My dad's letter to Mr. Van Dam, the formality of it demonstrates, I think, that they did not know each other. Dear Mr. Van Dam, with reference to your affidavit, we will never forget that you gave us the possibility to get away from Germany. And what this means can imagine only he, who like us in the concentration camp, had the opportunity to become acquainted with the despotism of the Third Reich. In conclusion, we thank you once more for your kindness and benevolence and remain yours ever gratefully. My dad and his two brothers arrived in San Francisco on October 6, 1939. Here are some documents. I have the originals. I'm not going to hold them up to you right now. Reflecting the passage, he went on the MS Kamakura Maro, Mr. Rudolf Gans, going from Shanghai to San Francisco, arriving October 6, 1939. Back to my mom's story. She was sent to Cambridge as a maid. She was 18, 19 years old, barely knew English. She worked for a decent family, but she, they worked her very, very hard, and they were very class conscious. She could not go out the front door. She was chastised once for walking out the front door. She could not, she had to live in the basement and was worked very, very hard, but she was safe and they were decent. One time they went on a little vacation, they came back, they were all excited, they had taken my mom. She at that point realized, I will never be able to go to my, back to my home again. And she stated in her audio, audio biography, those were long, worrisome months. Why? Her mom and dad were still locked up in Austria. Through the extraordinary kindness and diligence and work of extraordinary individuals in England, my mom and got her mother and her father out of Austria just in time because very shortly thereafter, Hitler invaded Poland. My mom said, it was such a relief that my parents got out. I can't begin to tell you. After Hitler invaded Poland, World War II, of course, had broken out. Those Jews that remained in Austria, many of them were immediately sent to concentration camps, soon to be killed, exterminated, including my mother's uncle on her mother's side, that uncle's wife, their children, my mother's first cousins, killed. My mother's other aunt on her father's side. That aunt's daughter, I'll tell you a tiny story about that aunt's daughter, her cousin, Edith. Edith was walking into a concentration camp holding tight to her six-year-old son, who was grabbed up from her arms by Dr. Mengele. Edith survived the camp. My mom, years later, asked her, how did you survive? She survived because she said, I wanted to see my son again. She never did. A quick but important shout out to the Butterfly Project. If, none of, if you have not heard of it, sometime during the next few days, Google the Butterfly Project. It has an extraordinary, it's a 
started in San Diego. It's now around the nation and around the world. And in a beautiful way, commemorates the one and a half million children who were killed. When I have talked to other audience, I try to explain to them, or try to say, you know, how can you fathom all this? And I say, well, think about your last Thanksgiving. And think about next Thanksgiving, maybe, when no one's there. Of course, as you know, six million Jews were killed and four to five million other individuals. They might have been handicapped, they might have been homosexual, they might have been of a different political persuasion, they might have been gypsies. 11 million individuals, innocent individuals were killed. When I do this in person, this is my first virtual uh, show. I hold up a larger version of this chart to try to show this was an industry of murder and it required hundreds of concentration camps, some large, some small, some of the larger ones, you know their names, Treblinka, Ravensbrück, Bergen-Belsen, Buchenwald, Dachau, Mauthausen, Belzac, Auschwitz, Sobibor. Well, for one and a half years, my mom worked as a maid. And, but they needed money. Her parents were there. They got a little house. They had a little extra room. And my mom opened a little seamstress shop. And I have the original of this where my mom tries to help people keep their old clothes. Remember, all materials now are going to the war effort. And so it was successful, but they needed more money because the parents were there, my grandfather and my grandma and herself. Recall that my grandfather was a master brewer. He got a job in London, England. They said to their friends in Cambridge, we're going to go to London. They responded, London? You can't go to London. Are you crazy? You can't go to London. Why? Because this is what was happening in London. From September 7, 1940, through May of 1941, London was systematically bombed by the Luftwaffe for 56 out of the following 57 nights. Can you imagine living under those circumstances? But they had to earn a, Victor had to earn a living, my grandfather Victor. So he, my mom, her mom, they went to London. My mom thought she'd be going to America very soon. My mom has some extraordinary stories about living under those circumstances. I won't go into them now. I will give you just a couple of tidbits. Stories about running into the bomb shelter at night. It was horrifying to hear the German bombers overhead, but what was, what, what, what was worse for my mom was the silent killers, the V2 rockets. In her words, those were the worst. No sirens, no warnings at all. She one day was, walked, was walking to where she had gotten a job as a seamstress, turned the corner, this is what she saw, or something very similar to this. Had she arrived at her business 30 minutes earlier, or a few hours earlier, I'm not exactly sure to be honest, she'd have been in there. One little story that I find pretty remarkable. She came home one night, out of the subway, out of the tube, got up, it was nighttime, blackout. All the cur blackout curtains, so you could see no visible light at all because they didn't want the Luftwaffe to identify London, England. And heavy black London fog. She couldn't see the, her hand in front of her face. She knew her address, but she didn't know how to get there. She couldn't see. A man next to her sensed her distress. He went up to her and said, can I help you? She told him his address. He was able to take her to her home. Why? He was blind and he didn't need to see anything. He could take her home. Thanks to the extraordinary courage of the Allied soldiers, sailors, Marines, Air Force, of course the Nazis were ultimately defeated. My mom, in her words, she went to Trafalgar Square for the spontaneous VE, Victory in Europe, celebration and there she saw and listened to Winston Churchill. It was just unbelievable 
that there would be no more bombings. My mom thought she'd be in London for just a few months. It took her three more years to get all of the paperwork, all of the authorizations and the money to be able to get to America. Here are the original of cablegrams. That's how people communicated. This is how she attempted to keep in contact with Rudy. Here's one of them. Here's another one indicating that she's actually going to arrive in LaGuardia Airport. I think it says here somewhere. Um, and she did arrive at LaGuardia Airport, but not the airport that you know of. She arrived on the water. In those days, it was a seaplane. She arrived on August 6, 1945, and after seven long, hard years, she and Rudy were united, reunited. On August 12, 1945, they were married in New York City. August 14, two days later, VJ Day, victory over Japan. The war was over. This is a picture of Times Square on VJ Day. This is a picture of Trafalgar Square. I don't know, but kind of crazy. My mom, Retta, she might be one of the very few, maybe only individuals who was in the crowd for the spontaneous breakout celebration for the E-Day in Trafalgar Square and also in Times Square for VJ Day. Euphoria, they're in America, they're safe. But my dad couldn't get a job. And he had his wife who couldn't get a job. Amazingly, my mom's parents came over and my dad's parents who were very sickly. They had no money. My dad needed a job. I'm going to show you a moment now, a letter that was written when I was five and a half years old. It was written to a gentleman by the name of Mr. Bulova. In those days, the Bulova Watch Company was one of the premier watch companies in the world. And this is the, I'm not going to read the whole thing. And I, I'm going to try to get through it, at least the part that I'm going to read. Um, here's the letter. And what it says in part, Dear Mr. Bulova, this letter is an expression of deepest gratitude to you, and I hope you will not consider it too presumptuous. If I take your valuable time, yet it was you, sir who helped me at a time of greatest need and gave me a job when it was almost impossible to find work. To you, it was a fleeting incident, but to me, it was a new chapter in my life when you granted me an interview in your Rockefeller Center office exactly 15 years ago today. I want to thank, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. You gave me a chance at a time when I needed it most. God bless you, sir. Anytime a question arises out about our beloved America, what it stands for and how her people are inspired by our democratic way of thinking, I think of you, Mr. Bolivar. It was real Americanism in practice, not theory, when you in your high and demanding position took time to listen to me and give me help. The best way for me to thank you is to continue with the best of my ability for Bolivar Watch and to do my bit to make your organization grow and prosper and to prove to you that your effort on my behalf was not in vain. As a father, I try to bring up my children to become good American citizens, holding you, Mr. Bova, as a shining example of a real American. With my heartfelt thanks, and also in the name of my family, respectfully yours. 32 years later, my dad retired from Bova. Legend has it, my mom swears it's true, he missed one day of work. And that's because he took off notwithstanding forecast of a blizzard and his car got stuck and couldn't make it. Now, that is actually the end of the slideshow, but I would like to take just a few minutes, one or two more minutes to tell you the same thing that I have said to other people who have listened to this presentation. <laughs> I hope you don't find this too pedantic. I hope you don't find this too presumptuous. I gotta say this. 
as I go through life, as we go through life, we need to do the right thing. Your inner voice, that is your heart, your conscience, tells you what's right and what's wrong. Follow your, inner, follow your inner voice, be active, be engaged, stand up to bullies, help those less fortunate than you, reach out, volunteer, recognize and appreciate all the blessings that you have every day. I do, I really do. War, not at your doorstep, a roof over your head, freedom from tyranny, supermarkets jammed with food, from all over the world, and perhaps most important of all, the opportunity to help your fellow man and woman. Recognize and appreciate all the blessings we have every day and do your bit to help make the world a better place for everyone. Thank you for your attention. Again, if anyone thinks this is worth showing to anybody else that you know, any groups, let me know, and I'd be happy to get in contact with them myself. Thank you, and thank goodness the technology worked. Now what I gotta do is try to get back to the regular screen. I don't know, if, this is where I've always had a problem. So let me see what happens. I got that done, I got that done. Now, I gotta get back to the regular screen, let's see possible. Oh, stop share. Okay. I got, oh, I got, <laughs> hi, Sarah. Hi, Melanie. Okay. Would you like to take some questions now, Bob? Yeah, I don't know that I'm going to know the answers. I don't know that I'm going to know the answers, but um, I'll be happy to take some questions. And I would love to be able to tell you about something that we're also doing here in San Diego that you might be interested in that's extremely related to this, to this um, presentation. So I'm ready to try to field some questions. How about if we start by, if you want to put it in the chat, or if you don't know how to use the chat, then unmute yourself and we can take your question directly then. All right, we have a question from Elise. Um, Bob, why was Greta able to become a seamstress and leave her position as a maid, is the question. Oh, she was, I, I believe she was doing both at the same time. I believe she was doing both at the same time. And she actually was able, because there was such a need in England in those times to preserve existing clothes, because materials were going to the war effort, she was actually able to have other people work with and for her. And then Jacqueline Gamash is wondering what the source of your documentation is. What the source of my documentation is? Well, uh, it's the memoir that my uncle wrote. It's some of the documents that you've seen, the passport, the maps, the tickets. I'm not sure what the question, maybe I'm not understanding the question properly. But, uh, and I got lots more photographs <laughs> and lots more documents, but you know, so much you can do in the space of an hour or so. That's right. What I, can I ask? Yeah. Melanie? Sure, What's go ahead. One? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean uh, from the time of the war to today and the just justification of the writings of that, how did you find all that after traveling so much as your parents are survivors? My mom, my mom, uh, moved out here to San Diego about nine years ago and um, brought all her stuff. And you know, I, like I think many Jewish youth in those days when I was growing up, we didn't talk about it that much. I'm not sure my parents wanted to talk about it that much. When my mom moved out here, I started going, looking at her albums and I was kind of blown away by what I saw. Uh, not only, I mean, I knew the story in general, but I didn't know the details. And then I found out that Hansel, my mom's brother, wrote a detailed, extensive autobiography. My mom has a audio biography that she did. Um, and then there's Vic's memoir and other albums. I mean, I have, I have birth certificates from my dad's grandfather. <laughs> and, and I have his birth, his birth certificate and his bar mitzvah certificate 
and the birth announcements. Uh, it's really, really pretty crazy. I'm going to take a moment and tell you about something um, that uh, we're doing here in San Diego that's very much related to this. It actually, for me, it was independent. I decided to do this, and then I started getting involved in an organization called Welcome Home. And um, it's, I'm going to read you, because I'm getting a little tired now, and I don't want to misstate it. Read you one sentence, which is the mission statement for Welcome Home. The reason it resonated so much with me is because of my parents' story. And the help that they got, and as I indicated, just a little bit of help can mean so much. Welcome Home is a volunteer service and funding organization committed to raising awareness of and resources for new Americans who have been displaced by war, famine, or persecution, and who now legally reside in San Diego. Folks like people who are translators for the United States Army in Afghanistan, folks like doctors in Iran who, because of their religion, have been persecuted. They come here with almost nothing. And what we have been doing is trying to raise funds. I'm not asking for anything, I'm just telling you, so that they can get some vocational training, so that they can do something other than sweep floors, because it has a generational impact. I'm a living example of the generational impact. If someone can at least get above minimum wage, then it can have such a positive impact on future generations and the uh, community as a whole. Nowadays, although we've done a lot in that regard, the vocational training has stopped because you know schooling has stopped. Mm -hmm. And so we have done something called embrace a family because these folks, you know, at the bottom of the rung, they ain't got nothing. Uh, and so, I just say it in case you're interested. There's a lot of welcome home organizations around the country. Welcome Home is one that's based in San Diego. It's a small little organization, but we've done some pretty cool things. Um, and um, as long as we had a moment, I wanted to share that with you. Somebody asked how they can get in touch with you. Email Bob, B-O-B, Gans, G-A-N-S, then the number seven at gmail.com. And the next question, I wonder if Bob can tell us about his feelings of the parents' hometown. This is from Stephen Schindler. Linz, Austria. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, a relative of mine has been working hard with some people in Linz, Austria to at long last have a memorial in Linz. Linz is one of the only towns left I think, in Germany and Austria, that does not have any kind of memorial to the Jews of Linz who are no longer there. And it's been a struggle. But at long last, after much resistance initially, at long last, a memorial has been formally approved, as I understand it. It, in fact, was to be, uh, I think, erected and, 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 and not consecrated, I forget the word, but uh, started. Uh, this summer. Now, I'm not sure what's going on because of everything going on around the world, but so um, what do I think of Lintz? You know, um, I, 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 in my heart, I believe there's a lot of wonderful individuals in Austria and Germany, and I do believe that they have made a substantial effort to try to um, do the right thing. Of course, Nonetheless, there continues to be horrific continuing undercurrents of rightist, anti-immigrant, anti-Jewish feelings. And um, I'm just afraid it's too strong. And I think this pandemic may make it worse because as people get more direct, more um, desperate, then they find it scapegoats again. <laughs> 